So it's time to pull out the furnace to rebuild it. So I'll start by shoveling up the stringers and I'll take off the rigging and the counterweight and then I'll take off the yoke and the door and then I'll take off the foot pedal as well. Foot pedals held on with uh, two little bolts on the sides. And then I'll take off these cement board side panels and then I'll be able to roll it out. But I'm going to mark the floor exactly where the wheels are now because I'd like to be able to put it back in exactly the same position so that I don't have to cut new cement boards. I should be able to use them again. I usually clean these up after every uh, session, which is usually 10 or 12 days long. I sprinkle a little water on there to keep the dust down. They're like a snow drift of colors depending on what I was making. going to pull the sill blocks out as well and vacuum out all the stringers and chips that I can before taking it outside. Now that I've rolled it out I can uh, pull out the elements and take off the electrical boxes. That's not bad. I got four out of five. One of them was really gummed in there and it broke. So now that I'm breaking it down, I've taken the fiber layers off here and I can see where glass has uh, seeped out into the insulation. This is one of the issues is that as the glass replaces the insulation, it is more mass and it takes longer to heat up and more energy to maintain temperature when all this extra mass from the leakage has to be considered. So I've broken it down now and I've flipped the crucible and its investment over. It's upside down there. So I'm going to smack that apart with a sledgehammer and throw it in the truck for disposal. But first I'm going to have a look at it and do a bit of a post-mortem. So that there are a couple of fins here coming through the spaces between the bricks so that indicates that there was a hole in the bottom of the crucible. It couldn't have been a very big hole because this is fairly minor seepage here. So there's a, a lot more seepage in here, a lot more finning as well, and that probably corresponds to the crack in the sidewall of the crucible about at that height. So this pile of material here will go to the landfill. I'm not going to reuse it anymore. And over here is the pile of stuff I'm going to reuse. So that's most of the fiber material is there. And there's actually 17 boxes of bricks that I'll be cutting and refitting. And there's the cage pieces there. The, the three on the right are the back and two sides. And the one on the left leading up against the building is the front. So I can start the rebuild right away, right from this position here. I don't need to take anything else uh, off the furnace frame here. So I've got my bottom course of bricks and an inch of fiberboard, and then I've got the first course of K23s uh, stood on their edges, so they're four and a half inches high. So I'll clean off the rubble and blow off the dust, and I'll start the rebuild right from here. There, I wanted to have a little look at the crucible before I smashed it up and took it to the landfill. It's amazing how flat surfaces, the glass will sit on a flat surface and just boil it and it froths up like popcorn or styrofoam. And I've got two real decent holes here in the crucible that the glass was flowing out of into the space between the crucible and the investment casting. And I'm really glad that I do an invested pot. There's no way I could have get any kind of decent crucible life out of this thing if I had a freestanding pot. I haven't done the numbers yet, but it's uh, close to 70,000 pounds I melted in this pot, so 35 tons came out of this pot. And uh, it's pretty good considering. Little 
flaky pieces coming off here which tend to flow down. They're a little bit heavier than the glass so they tend to go to the bottom but still have to pick out stones now and then. But overall I think it turned out pretty good. I think now that I'm rebuilding it I don't think I'll make any changes. I'm kind of happy with the design. I don't think it needs any modifications. So here's a chunk of the bottom of the crucible and when I was busting it up I found this region here full of really dark olive green glass and sure enough there's a three and a half inch framing nail sitting in the bottom of the crucible. I have no idea how that got in there but because iron oxide creates the olive green color the oxide coming off of that nail has made a little patch of really dark olive green glass here in the bottom of my pot. Alright, this is what I got done on the first day. I got the uh, two courses of bricks, three courses high, K23s around here, and I cut the corners and put in some filler material with some crappy bricks because every little bit of the investment material that I can displace with a lighter volume material means less mass, so it means I'm saving energy because I'm not heating up as much mass. So that's why I've added all this extra crap in there. I did it the first couple of times too, but this time I added even more than last time. So I'll slide the crucible in after I put in the wax paper. And the wax paper is to prevent moisture from the castable refractory from wicking down into the, into the dry bricks before it has a chance to cure. I'm also going to have to, after I slide the crucible in, I'm going to have to brick up the front and then to uh, prevent this from moving I'm going to have to put the fiber insulations around the outside and put the cage back together as well before I can pour the refractory. And I always put the damaged bricks towards the outside and put the good pristine new ones on the inside. Some of these bricks I've used in five different furnaces over a 25 year period, maybe even 30 years now, and they're still doing fine. And uh, basically it's a good place to store them until the next time I need them, which is when I scrap this furnace design I'll have several hundred bricks that I can use for something else, because they're not cemented together, they're just loose fit. So I've got the wax paper in and the crucible placed and the front bricked in. So now I'm going to place the layers of fiber and get the cage back on. Alright, so the cage is back on and the backup insulation is in place. So now I have the structural support that I need to be able to pour the investment refractory. So I've got the investment poured and I'm starting to place the upper chamber bricks now. Those are the K23s that go on the outside and they're vertical and the K26s will go on the inside of that and be horizontal. So I've run the upper chamber bricks up as far as I can right now and I've piloted in the uh, holes for the elements and now that I've got the outer row of bricks piloted in I can place the inner row and transfer the pilot marks to them. And here's those pilot holes run through to the outside. So here's the bottom of the crown form and the support to hold it up. 
it's going to be a couple hundred pounds of wet cement on this so it has to be really strong. If it broke through that would be really messy. And here's the top side of the bottom of the crown form. And the upper piece here just slides into place like this. And I'll fasten it from the top. And I'll put the refractory in through this space here and push it down into the far corners. Nice crown! Wow! Now for the hardest part for me that requires the most accuracy is the front arch bricks. They'll be cut into the crown and they'll go one level higher than the crown and they'll be two layers deep but they have to be completely flush on the outside so that the door closes nice and tightly and they'll be cemented into position as well. And here's the front face here, the outside layer. Got it all fit and ready to cement. And I've got a piece of glass here that I hold up here just to make sure that I have a nice flush surface here for the door to fit tightly against. All right, it's ready for cementing. Cut little notches in here for extra arch support. All these construction details are covered in the tutorial for designing and building these things. Okay, I'll cement these into place and then I'll brick up the top part and put the fiber on the crown. This condensated glass vapor is a bit of a hassle because I want to put these rods back in the new holes and this will be an obstruction. So I'm going to run it through my uh, tile saw and just grind off those edges. They, they grind off nicely, but I have to be careful not to actually grind the silicon carbide rods because uh, the silicon carbide is a softer material, so it tends to cut easier than the accumulated glass. Okay, all cleaned up and ready to install. So I've got it back in position and the rigging and counterweight back on the door and I put the side panels back on and I'm running it up to 250 and I'm going to hold it at 250 for a couple of days to burn off the moisture. And I've burned it in and run it up and I'm charging now for my first day's work. So this is what I'm making today on my first day back. So I'll make one from a distance and I'll make one close up. They take about three minutes to make and I sell them for $45.
this blob here I pour out onto a heated plate and it has to be heated so that the thing doesn't cup as it cools. And then the larger ladles used to pour the design. And I go around here in a circle and I come back and make a couple of more lines. And sometimes I put a line down the middle like this. Now I have to end my pour neatly, so I do that. And uh, I have a torch on the side in case I have to burn a stringer off, but I usually don't. There, now I have a few seconds to fold it up and place it on the base while the base is still hot enough for it to stick. And I have a minute to shape it. And that's about it. I'll have less than a minute to shape it. There, so that's a napkin holder for the dining room table to hold cloth napkins. But someone also decided that they would be good taco holders, so I've sold a few of them as taco holders. Yeah, the phone always rings when I'm doing video. Amazing. And off to the annealer. So they take about two, two and a half minutes to make. So I've run the furnace now for several days and I've gotten back into a, a routine of charging and cooking and overnight idling and that sort of thing. Keep track of my uh, kilowatt hours here. So in this 24 hour period it was along, on for 11.3 hours in total. And in this 24 hour period it was on for 11.4. And the next day I cooked the glass an extra hour and it was actually on for 12.1 hours out of 24. And on the side here is the number of items I made. There's uh, 129 that day, 180 that day. So that's the kind of uh, production use that the furnace is going through. But my main point in showing this is uh, 11 or 12 hours energized in 24 means that I'm paying around um, 17, 16 or 17 dollars to melt close to 200 pounds of glass. Here's a look at one of my production schedules here. These are the items that I make and these are the colors that I make them in and the totals down here on the bottom. So some colors aren't that popular. There's one that's 300 pieces, 700 pieces, but there's uh, 1800 pieces and 2200 pieces for the more popular colors. And the total at the end of that year was uh, 11,400 pieces. So I produce a lot of glass out of that furnace each winter. So every day I record the power consumption for that day, what color I melted, how many items I made that day. There's a 181 that day, 168 that day. I empty out that pot completely every day before I start to charge for the next day. So I go through the, the full charge every day. There's probably 150 of those sheets in here going back two decades and I've melted close to a quarter million pounds of glass through that furnace design now since I built it originally in 2001. And it actually cost about $4,000 back then to build the furnace and that includes the price of the controller.